off, uh, just to begin with, let's just go back to the, um, the main chart, remind ourselves that what we're looking at here is the witnessing period, one of those periods in the revelation which helps us to tie the whole thing together. And in the first session, we looked at the witnessing of the saint, the ecclesia, and we began to look at the witnessing of the Protestants, and that's what we want to continue uh, in this second session. Now, we also looked at this chart, and let's just go through that to set the scene to what we're doing. These are developments uh, in the ecclesia from the first century onwards. So, in the first century ecclesia, we have the true worshippers who the Apostle Paul describes as virgins in 2 Corinthians 11, and the prophecy refers to them as the temple of God and the holy city. But then we considered those who went astray from the true, true teachings of the Apostles, and they are described in chapter 12 of Revelation as an unfaithful woman and how that class of people divided yet again into the witnesses that we are considering and also those who went uh, a stage further and ended up as being described as poor the roman catholic system so for many years there were three different uh, groups of people in the world there were the true believers there were the Protestants and also the Roman Catholic system. But we know that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there will be just two groups of people. There will be still the true believers. They are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ who will be united with him at that time. And the Protestants and Roman Catholicism, we know, are uniting right now as we speak at the end there will be these two groups of people the bride who will be united with the lord and the the whore who will be destroyed by him so we looked at the true believers as the witnesses and we began by looking at the, the witnesses in the second part of the chapter so we want to consider with those witnesses uh, now These witnesses have the ability to use force against the papacy, whereas the Ecclesia didn't. They were um, bound by the uh, teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ not to use force uh, in, in this dispensation. But, but these uh, witnesses were allowed to use force and they did use force against the papacy as verse 5 of chapter 11 tells us if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed we noted last time that the the papacy had power as well so this resulted in war between the two classes of people if any man will hurt them fire devoureth out of their mouth we are told the, the true believers could not do that, but these witnesses could. We have an example there of when it was used in Old Testament times. I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee with the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of brutish men and skillful to destroy. And that's what happened from time to time with, with the Catholics during this period. Verse 6 says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. They have the ability to do these things. We say, how did they have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not? If we consider once again back into Old Testament times, why were the heavens closed in Old Testament times? Uh, then the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain 
and that the land yield not her fruit. And it was, of course, a form of punishment, wasn't it? And that's what these witnesses were able to do. They were able to punish the, the Catholics uh, from time to time. It was a bit of tit for tat, really. And sometimes the, the Protestants, the uh, Huguenots later on, were successful. Other times the Catholics were. It is one example. We could, we could cite many, but here's one. Uh, it's all about Pro Pope Gregory the Seventh and the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Henry the Fourth. We read that Gregory summoned Henry to Rome as if he were a feudal vassal. Henry refused to go, and he persuaded a German council to depose the Pope. The Pope, in turn, threatened excommunication. Henry called the Council of Worms and denounced papal authority. Henry was excommunicated and an anathema was placed against his subjects. No one could or would have any dealings with Henry or give him food or shelter for fear of eternal torments. That's the way that the Catholics dealt at this time. But the story goes on. Ultimately, Henry was forced to make his peace with Gregory. Barefooted and dressed as a humble penitent, he was compelled to stand for three days in the papal courtyard in the snow. On the fourth day, the pontiff agreed to receive him. He pled for clemency, confessed his fault, made his humble submission at the Pope's feet and received absolution. And this was a great triumph for the papacy. But that was not the end of the story. Read, Henry received back his position and power and was able to drive Gregory out of Rome. In the end, Henry won the last round and Gregory died in exile and said dejectedly, which of course is not true, I have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore I die in exile. So there we've got an example of how that the two main rulers in the Holy Roman Empire, the Pope and the Emperor, were all the, all the while vying for the top position, as it were. And this was going on for centuries. Here's another example from the book History of Protestantism. And it shows how that the Protestants were destroying a papal image at Zurich. This went on for 1260 years until eventually we arrive at the year uh, 1572 which was the year of the massacre of St Bartholomew when the Huguenots were massacred in, in a terrible way by the Catholics. Encyclopedia Britannica comments on it here the massacre of French Huguenots or Protestants in Paris on August 24 and 25, 1572. It was one event in the series of civil wars between the Roman Catholics and the Huguenots that beset France. We note France is all happening in France in the late 16th century. We read more about it here with the end of religious witnessing. But in the months following St. Bartholomew's day, thousands of Protestants recanted their faith. For some, this was a temporary compromise, extracted by torture or moral danger, sorry, mortal danger. For others, it was a permanent decision to abandon a religious cause that now seemed hopeless. That's the way that they saw it. One eyewitness reported that more than 5,000 abjurations in Paris alone took place by the end of September that year. Even the Bourbon princes, Navarre and Condé, submitted to threats and temporarily converted to Catholicism. Reform leaders were stunned. Theodore Berzer remarks, the number of apostates almost defies counting, so many that they could hardly count them. Evidence suggests 
Not all of these converts, converts were simply the product of fear or cowardice. Some Protestants were shocked by God's apparent indifference to their plight and viewed the slaughter as divine judgment against them. If only they'd have read the prophecy, they would have understood exactly what was happening and also what was to come. As time goes on, we're in 1587 now. The wars between the Catholics and the Huguenots continue, but now they are purely political. We read here from the Chronicle of the World. In the Eighth War of Religion, which began two years ago, Henry Navarre defeats a Catholic army. This latest Catholic Huguenot conflict has developed into a struggle for the French succession. So the yellow on the map there indicates Catholic areas, the, the mauve Huguenot, and the shaded areas, the disputed areas. That's what they were fighting over at this particular time. The thing is, witnesses were now no longer fulfilling the terms of the prophecy. They were not witnessing on a, a religious uh, platform at all. It was purely politics. And as, as the Chronicle says, it was a struggle for the French succession. We come a few more years on again to 1598 and the Edict of Nantes. We read that Henry IV, King of France, signed the perpetual and irrevocable Edict of Nantes. It granted Protestants freedom of conscience throughout the kingdom. The edict also restored their old places of worship to them and granted them permission to build new ones. They now have equal civil civic rights with Catholics and are allowed access to all public posts. A full amnesty is granted to all who took up arms during the wars of religion and a hundred towns are assigned to the Huguenots as towns of refuge. So this was a victory really for the the Huguenots at this time and yet they continued with their political uh, aspirations for the throne of France. We say here the witnessing was still not according to the terms of the prophecy. They were well, not still not witnessing on a religious context. It was purely politics and eventually we read here that the Pope hits back at this. Pope Gregory the Fifteenth is proving a skillful politician. His choice of new saints shows careful attention for the temporal needs of the Catholic Church in its struggle against Protestantism. Four prominent Jesuits, including their founder Ignatius Loyola, are among the new saints. It is the Jesuits above all who have spearheaded the Catholic fight against the Protestants. So here we see the Catholic Church fighting back at this time. But eventually we come to what the uh, prophecy describes as the political death of the witnesses. It's as though God has given them over a hundred years to revert to witnessing in a religious sense, but they've not done it. Is this another example of the long suffering of God? He waits and he waits, but eventually the, the death of the witnesses comes. The prophecy is at verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So we hear, read here in 1865. King Louis XIV today revoked the Edict of Nantes signed by his father in 1598 and granting religious and political freedom to the Huguenots. Louis is determined to stamp out Protestantism in France. Protestant worship is to be forbidden. The church is demolished. All citizens are being forced into Catholic baptism and marriage. Ministers have refused to recant are being banished and many Catholics today are rejoicing the Chronicle of the World says 
Protestantism was a political threat to the monarchy while it existed, and he and Louis XIV decided to completely uh, destroy the Huguenots once and for all. It didn't succeed, but it was it was a terrible time for the the Protestants and for the uh, Huguenots at this time. Verse 7, it says, when they shall have finished the testimony, it's the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit that makes war against them and overcomes them and kills them. So it's in chapter 7 where we read about the beast in the, in the prophecy for the, for the first time. It was the fourth beast that Daniel saw in chapter 7. Perhaps we can just turn back to that chapter and, and read one or two verses from it. So... Daniel chapter 7, and if we go in at verse 19, where Daniel says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up and uh, before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And this little horn, of course, is, is the papacy arising, arising out on the Roman beast. Uh, Daniel says at verse 21, I beheld that horn, the same horn, made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. He says at verse 23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And of the ten horns out of this kingdom, are, there are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and seasons and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. So this is the power that arose on that Roman beast, the Roman Catholic power. The prophecy goes on to say in verse 8, The dead bodies of these witnesses shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now we've already looked at the second part of that verse, but it's the first part that's interested now. Their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city. The word street means main thoroughfare or broadway and we ask the question where was the main thoroughfare of the holy roman empire um, at this time we read here that the kings of france referred to themselves in communications with the pope and by the popes in reply as the eldest son of the church so france was particularly important as far as the Holy Roman Empire was concerned. And as we've seen, it's in France where we've seen all these things happen, the massacre of the Huguenots and so on. So if we think of the great city Babylon that we looked at in the first session, there it is, the Roman Empire. So the street is France, the main thoroughfare where, where the main things happened. Uh, in relation to this prophecy. So that's the street of the city. This is a verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So it was open to everyone that these prophet, these witnesses had been destroyed. And then verse 10, they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And many people 
whether they were Catholic or not, were so relieved to see the end of these terrible wars that were going on in France. But it was the Catholics particularly that were rejoicing at this time. We read, didn't we, from the, the, the uh, Chronicle of the World, Protestant worship is to be forbidden, the church is demolished, and many Catholics are rejoicing today. And the next thing we read at verse 11, and after three days and a an half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell on upon them which saw them. Here we've got what we sometimes refer to as the resurrection of the witnesses. It was after three days and a an half. So if we start at 1685 and we add three and a half days or years, we come to no significant uh, date at all. However, we need to keep digging to find out what this is about. We know that God created the sun, the moon, the earth, and the stars. He sometimes uses the way in which the earth turns to interpret these prophecies. Here we've got the way in which the moon turns. The earth turns once every day on its axis. The moon turns once every 30 days on its axis. So if we interpret this prophecy to speak about the rotation of the moon every 30 days, three and a half times 30 gives us 105. And if we, we say 1685 plus 105, it brings us to 1790, which is a most significant date. It is, of course, the French Revolution, when, amongst other things, the Roman Catholic Church lost its power to uh, torture in the way that it had been doing. But you might say, is this not just poking around with things to try and find something to fit? Why use the rotation of the moon to interpret this period? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, we call it the etiquette of the symbol. You see, all these symbols are based on literal things. And dead bodies cannot lie in a street for 105 days, literally speaking. So another way of interpreting this, interpreting this is necessary. We know that the moon is used symbolically to describe a woman, and a woman is used as a religious power in Revelation, as we, we've already seen that. To give an example of that, go back to Genesis 37, these are the dreams of Joseph, how he dreamt that the sun, the moon, and the stars bowed down to him. And it was his father who says, what does this mean? Shall I, that's the sun, and thy mother, that's the moon, and thy brethren, that's the stars, indeed to come indeed come to bow down ourselves to the to the earth. So that's the way that Jacob interpreted what Joseph had dreamt. So this particular prophecy is all about religion. It is a religious power that we're speaking about. So really it fits perfectly when we look at it in that way. What does Proverbs say? It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. And that's what we have to do. And the more we dig, the more we find, and, and the more we find it, it all fits together, this amazing prophecy. So verse 12 says, They heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Come up hither. What do we read? French Revolution, 1790. The profane and scandalous cord at with Rome has been abolished, because 
According to the politician, the Count of Maribu, it was concluded between an immoral Pope and a despot without the knowledge of church or empire in order to divide the rights and gold of Frenchmen between two usurpers. That's the emperor and, and the Pope. So that was destroyed. And the Chronicle records that there. He goes on to say, the social and economic impact of the revolution is being felt in every aspect of life. Actors, Jews, that's interesting, and Protestants now officially enjoy full civil rights. They are told to come up hither. They were no longer downtrodden. They had full rights as all other citizens had. So let's just, in conclusion, draw a timeline of the whole thing. We've got two time periods in this prophecy. One, 1260 days, which we interpret as 1260 years, from 312 to 1572. And then we've got these three and a half days, or lunar days, 105 years, from 1685 to 1790. So the first period began when Constantine proclaimed Christianity as the state religion. And that's when persecution began of the saints and all others who witnessed against it. It's, it's the history books that tell us that once the Christians were in power, they persecuted those who did not agree with them. And that includes the saints and these other witnesses as well. And that went on for... 1260 years. The witnessing ended, as we've seen, in 1572 at the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Following that date, the wars went on between Huguenots and Catholics, but now it's not religious, it's a purely political struggle for the French throne, as we have seen. All way through that period, we've got the Edict of Nantes, and that granted political freedom to the Huguenots. But that was by and large ignored, particularly by the Catholics. So it's not until we get to 1685, the Edict of Nantes was revoked, and we've got the political death of the witnesses, because they were not fulfilling the terms of the prophecy. And then begins this period of the, the witnesses uh, lying in the street of the city for this period of 105 years. It concluded when, in terms of the prophecy, it says the spirit of life from God entered into them. And we've seen from that quote in the Chronicle how that they now enjoy full civil rights. In that respect, they came up to heaven. But it's this phrase, the spirit of life from God entered into them. It's as though they now can continue their religious witnessing. It's interesting, if we look at what happened after that. In 1793, that's during the French Revolution, an English clergyman was born, Edward Bishop Elliot, and he wrote the book Hare Apocalyptic, or Hours with the Apocalypse. And this is how one historian describes it. It absolutely destroys the Jesuit-inspired preterist system by conclusively proving a late date for the writing of the Book of Revelation. Elliot also demonstrates the impossibility of the futurist system, which, like preterism, was also concocted as a system by the Jesuits. So, Straight after 1793, when the Spirit of God entered into them, it's as though other um, witnesses started their witnessing against the Roman Catholic system. There's another one, Alexander Hislop. He was the Church of Scotland minister, and he wrote the book Two Babylons, uh, equating, equating Babylon of old with the Roman Catholic Church. And there were, there were numerous others, actually. We mentioned uh, Charles Spurgeon. He was a Baptist preacher. He started in 1834. And there were other Baptist preachers as well at that time. 
Sadly, the Church of England and the Church of Scotland are now racing back, as it were, towards Catholicism. And sadly, there are elements within Christadelphia where they are moving towards that direction as well. We pray, don't we, that we may remain faithful to the teaching of Scripture, that we may continue to speak out against the things which are wrong, so that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we might be welcome into that kingdom that he will establish, that will last forever. Well, I'll just come back to the, uh, the timeline of the witnesses to uh, fill in the last few verses of the chapter. Uh, we noted when we were looking at the, the witnesses, we got as far as the year 1790. And it was in it was in verse 11, sorry, in verse 12 of chapter 11, that we read those words. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And then we've got the resurrection of the witnesses. It's in the very next verse that we read this. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. And this is actually the second great earthquake in the prophecy. The first one being in the days of Constantine when uh, pseudo-Christianity was made the state religion. And here we've got the second earthquake. And what we see with this earthquake is it's a French Revolution. And we shall look at, in more detail at this when we look at chapter 16. But the French Revolution was an in, a very notable event and it was it was a world changing event as well. I suppose we could summarize it by saying that it was the time when there was another change in religion and the change in religion changed to that of humanism. So coming back to the, the main chart, um, what we are looking at is that second great earthquake in the apocalypse. As we say on the chart, uh, it results in the religion of humanism being uh, rampant in the earth. The other thing I want to um, show here is how that this great earthquake actually takes place in the sixth trumpet and that's what we've shown on the on the chart there if we look at revelation 11 and just read those few verses 13 to 15 we read and the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake were were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Right, we noted at verse 14 there, the second woe is past, and the second woe is the sixth trumpet. And then it says, the third woe cometh quickly. The third woe is the seventh trumpet, and that's why it says in verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded. Right, so we're moving here through and looking at the, the way in which the prophecy is it is put together as it were and we've got this great earthquake and immediately after the earthquake we're told that the second woe is past and that's why we reach the conclusion that this great earthquake actually takes place in the second woe or the sixth trumpet when we come to the third woe or the seventh trumpet that's when john as it were sees right through into the kingdom age Verse 15, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord 
and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. But the following verses tell us actually that that was not what happened immediately. As so often we, we read in the prophecy and in scripture as a whole for that matter, we are given the final result. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of his Christ. But then we're told how that is achieved, events leading up to it, as it were. That's where we come to the seventh trumpet. And if we look at verse 18, one of the things that have to happen before the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord is verse 18. The nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou should give reward to thy servants, the prophets, etc. There's a clue there where it says the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. That, that's a clue that takes us into really chapter 16. The vials of the wrath of God, which are poured out on the earth, immediately preceding the uh, return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the vials of the wrath of God are actually contained in this seventh trumpet or the third woe. And that's why we show on the screen there that the seventh trumpet actually contain, contains the vials in the same way that the seventh seal contained the trumpets. So that by the time we reach the kingdom age, we're at the end of the seventh seal, the end of the seventh trumpet, and the end of the seventh vial as well. So in these verses, right, following verse 14, we're given, we're given these details, and obviously, we don't have time now to, to look at them in detail. We'll, we'll look at them later on, when we, as, as we say, when we go to chapter 16. But for now, what we're saying is we pray for that great day to come, do we not? When the kingdoms of this world, which is in such a sorry state, will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and when he will reign forever and ever.